that the semantic web has developed quite some uh, good tools that could allow it to take its part in this knowledge evolution. But um, the actual data centrism uh, provided a very nice success, which are very interested, interesting, but um, somewhat hampers uh, the development on the evolution of knowledge. And I will then propose two different tracks to uh, try to deal with that. The first one is uh, semantic e-science, which is rather a direct application of what we already have. Okay? So this is something that we can right now uh, start developing. And uh, then I will come back to something quite different, is uh, to try to understand how we can interleave um, knowledge evolution uh, with the semantic web as it is at the moment. But there is something else because I thought, okay, um, people invited me to talk because I've been around for quite some time and maybe I could deliver some point to the younger people. And deliver that I would like to, uh, to, to, to point out after some, uh, quite some time working in research is that a good idea remains a good idea. And it's really a, a good point. There are people who are really freaking out about the idea of reinventing the wheel. Um, but the point is that um, sometimes a good idea doesn't take off because um, there are some conditions which are not uh, offered. Uh, so, for example, in, in this example, you can think of the guy who invented the wheel, but you never think about the guy who realized that using more than one wheel, two wheels is important. And maybe the guy who generalizes this to n wheel, and et cetera, et cetera. And actually, the types tell you that. You see good ideas, you say, yeah, that's great, we should work on that, and then you look back, and no one is with you doing it. But a few years later, suddenly someone rediscovered it, the name has changed, etc. So some people can say, yeah, they are reinventing the wheel. But then the condition may be better or not and provide the opportunity to develop this good idea. So then the lesson of this is, uh, well, if it doesn't take off, maybe you can anyway try to persevere. That's uh, something to do. Okay, so this talk is about knowledge. And uh, I realized recently uh, that uh, when I talk about knowledge, I think I'm very clear about what I'm talking about, but uh, it's not necessarily the case, especially because the term already is a bit polysemic. Uh, if you consider it in, uh, uh, from uh, an epistemological point of view, um, knowledge is defined as true belief. Okay? And on the other side, on knowledge representation, we rather make a distinction between uh, general statement uh, uh, and uh, data which are uh, more individual statements. And you can think if you do DL about A box, T box, of course. Um, so you can divide this definition in this way. You will have uh, an individual uh, or particular belief, which is the capital of Francis Auckland, and uh, individual knowledge saying, telling you that uh, the capital of New Zealand is uh, Wellington. Uh, but you can have the same for general statements, like uh, you may have the statement that the capital of a country is the largest city of that country, uh, which is maybe a belief, okay, but uh, as a knowledge, you rather have the capital of a country is located in this country. I haven't found a counterexample to that. And so basically, what I, when I'm talking about knowledge, I'm talking about what is in red here and not what is in blue. Now, if you're working in knowledge graphs, try to think about where you are in this diagram. Okay, so I will uh, go ahead with the uh, development now. Uh, I wanted to, um, to argue about the idea that knowledge is important for human beings, but actually the uh, keynote speaker of yesterday already did this in one slide, so you have the summary of the following section. Uh, and this is uh, the story of a bunch of good ideas, okay? And this is basically what I will uh, deliver here. And so I wanted to look at uh, the future of the semantic web, and I say, okay, let's try to look at the back, at the past, and then I look at the past of its past, and you can go very far away, further away on that, and start with uh, vegetables, for example. Uh, in, somewhat, you c in some sense, you can say that they sense their environment. Animals, of course, do it. Uh, some of them can memorize such experiment and learn from this experiment. Some of them can 
learn from others' animals and some imitate them. So the, the way you can see it is that you've got an individual in these environments. Through perception, it acquires data. From data, it can learn knowledge. And then it can use this knowledge in order to act on the environment. And then it provides a loop uh, which allows you to uh, improve your knowledge relatively continuously. Okay, but usually you don't have one individual in an environment, you may have several of them. Okay, and then you've got two ways to consider this. Okay, either you consider that the other are part of the environment and you just interact with them. And basically one thing that you can do is imitate them. Or you consider that the other are somewhat like you and you form a society. Okay, and then you can start to act with this society uh, in terms of cooperation, for example. And it allows you, even if you don't explicitly transmit knowledge, to uh, adapt your knowledge and to change it. Okay? So there is uh, now perception allows you to do that, but also uh, cooperation with others. And so this is the first uh, stepping stone, I would say, that uh, when individuals interact often, uh, they form a society. And um, their interaction, their way of behaving, it helps shaping uh, something which is called a culture, okay? Uh, and a culture is something very vast, and it's basically a shared way to deal with things. And this was uh, make the cement of society. So it leads to things like tradition, uh, training, cooperation, and also identifying. Yes, uh, your culture allows you to identify yourself as part of a particular society. Okay, now when you start to express, to be able to express knowledge explicitly, you can do further than that, but communicate this uh, knowledge across individuals. And this is something which is quite different. So first thing is that it requires uh, articulated language, like our natural language that we have here. And this is uh, articulated language that allows for knowledge communication, okay? That you are able to understand statements that you have never heard before, that you have never experienced. Um, and the, the very important feature of that is that then you don't have to experience uh, the knowledge that you will have by yourself, okay? It can be transmitted directly to you. You don't have to relearn it from scratch, okay? And both the language that is used for communicating and the knowledge are part of culture. And this led to things like teaching universities and conferences. Okay, this is because I'm trying to articulate some knowledge uh, to transmit it to you that we are here. Um, so this makes difference between two kind of things in uh, uh, the transmission of knowledge. Either you can discover it by yourself, by observing, by experimenting, or it can be transmitted from other people in your society or in other societies. Uh, so it can start with imitating, training, which doesn't require uh, articulated language, um, but it can also uh, be obtained by communica communicating direct, directly this uh, knowledge. And this is not something that step on, on top of each other, okay? Uh, of course, when you are young, you are a baby, uh, you start with uh, doing observation, then you experiment by throwing things on the ground, and you observe that uh, then when you do that, your mother gets upset, and, but she comes very quickly. And um, after some time, you try to understand what uh, 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 she tried to express, and then you acquire language, and then you start to go to school, and between five and uh, 25 years, uh, you learned a lot of uh, uh, formal, not formally, but uh, uh, articulated uh, uh, knowledge, okay? Um, and so this is uh, basically the, the proportion, but you never stop experimenting in your life. You never stop experimenting uh, the awkward way of interacting with someone, for example, and then you understand that you are not supposed to do it this way, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't have the, 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 uh, the need that it is explicitly told to you. You are able, still able to learn, and this continues to happen. So this is something that happens from all human beings, and all along their life. Uh, there is something else which was also mentioned uh, later, uh, yesterday, which is uh, quite important. It's a recording, okay, it's like writing. Um, it's important because it allows you to get rid of space and time. 
For example, you can uh, still read a book of someone who has written it uh, two, cent two, two, million, two thousand years ago. Um, and uh, also you can talk with people who are very far away from you. Uh, and this improves the transmission accuracy so that uh, it's not because tra oral tradition has a lot, may have a lot of change, but here you can refer to something that was written uh, far away in time and uh, 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 still think that it is a, an accurate citation. And of course, this led to books, libraries, uh, and journals. But again, um, these were uh, great ideas, uh, but you can think that they did not come in one day. Okay? Uh, for example, the idea of writing certainly started by writing on sand, okay? and uh, accuracy and the uh, length of conservation of this writing was not very, very good, okay? and it improved over the year. So this is a technological factor that uh, make that by improving the technology, then suddenly it become viable and adopted by everyone. Uh, just a remark that uh, recording and language are two totally different things, especially nowadays we can see this because um, we have the tendency, well, I have the tendency uh, to consider that writing is the first kind of recording and it's always about uh, expressed, uh, 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 explicitly expressed knowledge. But actually, nowadays, a lot of people uh, rely on movies uh, which may not rely uh, on a, a, a particular language, may not. Uh, and of course, uh, you can have a, a culture without language, like, uh, for example, this Akas. Uh, so, in summary, what is really important is learning, communicating, recording, and um, the point is that it's certainly a unique feature combination of our uh, species, uh, and uh, without which knowledge will have been to relearn, and we should not be able to reach the kind of state in which we are. Whether you like it or not is another uh, thing. And the web, in this respect, was really an amplifier of that. Okay? Uh, it allows to more easily and readily uh, make possible to publish knowledge and to get it accessible to a lot of people. It revolutionized a lot of things. For example, you can think of Stack Overflow, which basically changed the way people program. Uh, or Wikipedia, which changed the way people do their homework, for example. Um, but, I mean, if you were there before the web and after the web, it's kind of totally different world, actually. So the semantic web in all this, the semantic web was a very good idea as well. Okay, so the semantic web is a web not only for machines, but also for machines. Uh, so actually, the web was already processed by machine, but the point was to be able to express its content. Okay? But you can distinguish be be between several types of content. Eh? Uh, you can distinguish between uh, metadata, which is not really content. Eh? It's data about the, the, the content, but it's um, first kind of uh, information which is uh, maybe exploited. Then you can consider specialized data. Um, I mentioned a few of them. Agenda address, it is so, something that you, you actually know what it, how it is supposed to be. An agenda is supposed to be put in an agenda software, okay? And this is basically the kind of uh, information that was in a, a seminal uh, semantic web uh, paper of Scientific America, which was uh, exploited there. But you may be a bit more ambitious and try to express everything which is uh, uh, in a web page, okay? Not only the info box of uh, uh, Wikipedia, but actually the content of the articles. So I wanted to give an example of uh, data without knowledge. And so does someone know what is the meaning of this? Someone who doesn't, haven't seen this uh, picture before. Yeah? As spread civilization? Not yet. Agriculture. Agriculture. You have seen it already before? No. Oh, OK. So the numbers, are so very good, huh? we've got very, very accurate uh, presentation. So the numbers are yours, yours before our ears, and it's a spread of uh, agricultural society, okay? And actually this uh, map was in a, a very influential paper, the next knowledge medium for, from uh, Mark Steffick. Um, but you can imagine 
uh, what is the computer face, facing a knowledge graph, okay, instead of uh, such a map. Um, so, when we started uh, along this uh, semantic web idea, there has been development of uh, very uh, important uh, technologies, I would say, uh, which allows you to express data and relation on the web. So it is RDF, whatever the format you use. Huh? If you don't like uh, uh, some format, you can use another one. Uh, you can express uh, knowledge with uh, ontology language, such as RDFS and all the old spaces. Then you can express query, rather sophisticated nowadays, uh, with Sparkle, but also variants and spa of Sparkle. And there are plenty of other language that I won't mention, likely because I know them less. Um, and it have been, these languages have been used, in particular for developing uh, a lot of specific ontologies, we can, which can be related to uh, very general things. You can imagine that there is an ontology about provenance. Okay? But, uh, get back uh, without the rationale for doing this um, 20 years ago, and if someone told you, I will do an ontology without, uh, about provenance, it would have had to explain you what you are talking about. Okay? You've got ontology uh, about uh, uh, work, uh, like uh, FRBR, which I like very much, so I mention it, but also some very more uh, um, concrete object like proteins or restaurants. You've got all this, which is available. And so this could have uh, uh, led to a very lively uh, knowledge ecosystem um, in which explicit knowledge can take its part to, to do a, a lot of tasks. Um, so machines could take advantage of knowledge to uh, correct it to provide you uh, application, tells you if the restaurant you, where you want to go is open at that moment. That's okay, a very uh, interesting application. But it may also help you, and, and, and if it's not open, to suggest you another one. Um, it may help you uh, to elaborate knowledge, and I'm thinking about the semantic washing machine, which was proposed by uh, Sorenauer and, and Jens Lehmann. That is, for example, using explicit knowledge in order to clean up the data in uh, uh, DBpedia, and then to clean up Wikipedia. But if you're a bit more ambitious, you so can also imagine that a machine may contribute knowledge, okay? And so here you are in the realm of uh, artificial intelligence, a uh, machine trying to mine relatively autonomous, autonomously uh, knowledge in order to suggest you uh, some new one. Okay. And, well, we are not there. So the question is, uh, what went wrong? Uh, so there may be a number of things. It may be that the market was not mature. I don't know, but it did not take off. Okay. So what went wrong is basically that we had all these technologies, but we did not have uh, the data to work on, and it's really not uh, terribly useful for some people uh, if you don't have the data. And so. Um, some very clever people had this idea of uh, uh, linked open data, for instance, and publishing more data on the web, and that's what happened. Um, so if you uh, listen to the uh, keynote uh, lecture of uh, Tim Berners-Lee two years ago for the uh, Turing Awards, um, basically he said, oh, what is the semantic web? This is schema.org and linked open under linked open data cloud. Okay? So, Yes, this is success, very good success of the semantic web, but mostly focused on, on, on data. And this is justified. We really need this. We need this. And uh, this provides us with a, a lot of interesting applications, statistical data aggregation, and especially at the level of uh, uh, um, uh, country uh, statistical data, semantic sensor network, and now semantic uh, IoT. Uh, digital assistants, which take advantage of this, and uh, question answering, and of course, uh, search, and knowledge, uh, search and knowledge graph expo exploitation. So one of the, 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 the things that I like very much is, for example, I can ask for Marie Curie husband's brother, and I can ask for the same in French. This is changing all the day. I took this yesterday, and uh, two days before it was different. But, um, and the system is able directly to answer this question. And actually, when we started in 2000 working on semantic web, if 
I would have been told that 20 years later, and actually 15 years later, we would have debt, I would have signed. Okay? Um, the reason is that at that time I was not very optimistic about semantic search for two reasons. Uh, search was uh, very, very uh, accurate already, okay? And we were far away to improve on that. And the second reason is that the major player in search were absolutely not interested in explicit knowledge, okay? So we would have to bid them directly and that would have been very difficult. On the other side, there was some new trends, uh, web services, okay? And there was this uh, semantic web services things, which looks very cool because there was no services at that time, basically. So it was very easy to bid them. And I think semantic web service is a very good idea. But um, I don't know if there are semantic web services uh, people here. There is no session, yeah. <laughs> That's okay, it's doing plenty of things, so it's still following the good ideas. This is a, a good example, do like Terry. Uh, so there is no semantic uh, web services uh, uh, at, the, at the conference anymore. But these are good ideas, and they remain good uh, uh, ideas. Huh? So I think semantic web services, maybe not web, they will have another name, but they will show up uh, later at some point, because being able to opportunistically select a service uh, 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 based on this description is something that has to be done at some point. Okay, so what happened is that we have all this data, and we're, and uh, the, the use of this data is, uh, has permitted something uh, basically to uh, uh, unleash the, cap the power of machine learning, okay? And to provide a lot of uh, very uh, impressive uh, application, okay? So this is really a good thing already. Uh, so you can name a number of them, behavior classification or object recognition, uh, natural language translation, uh, relation discovery, and I'm some of you are working on drug illness interaction, for example. Um, recommendation and search, uh, obviously. And so, if the question is, does data make the web more intelligible to machine? I would answer definitely. Okay, this is really, really, uh, really true. However, some of my colleagues um, are a bit too enthusiastic about this, and they are in the room, so they can uh, answer. Uh, so they said recently, our fellow computer scientists can both benefit from the additional semantic and structure of the data available on the web and continue to build on using the structure, creating a, virtu a virtuous circle. Actually, what circle are you talking about? Okay, there is no circle. What happened at the moment is that we are a company who acquire giant data meshes. Okay, they acquire data from the interaction with their services. Okay. Eventually, this data is open. Uh, so, of course, what they do with this data is to learn, okay? And you can expect that they are learning knowledge. But they don't share this knowledge. This knowledge is in their silo, and they are only interested into exploiting it, okay? And actually, you, you think that you are the people who are able to provide knowledge to this machine. But actually, they are not interested in it, okay? They're interested in several things like what you like, what you click on, and what you buy. And they will train their system on this. And so the problem is that um, since this knowledge, which is very efficient and uh, very useful, uh, is sometimes not explicit, but also, uh, most of all not shared, it doesn't allow us to improve, because no one can improve on it. It can only, only come back to the data. And uh, I found, I did not knew the, the the book which was uh, cited yesterday by the keynote talk, but uh, I think the data-centric revolution is exactly the, the, the word to use. Revolution means coming back to the starting point, okay? This doesn't mean evolution. You don't evolve, you come back. This is a actually very accurate uh, uh, keyboard uh, key which is on this, uh, on this uh, paper. So if you think about what I started with, that is, our civilization, our, uh, civilization is based on knowledge evolution. This is rather regression, okay? We are basically in some kind of dead ends, which is a nice dead end, but um, we cannot build on that. 
And so the question is what can be done about that? And uh, two proposals that I will try to discuss very briefly uh, are e-science and putting knowledge evolution on the web. That's okay. We will be on time. Um, so e-science is a very obvious use case, okay? Because science is about uh, improving knowledge. It's about knowledge sharing and uh, knowledge evolution. Uh, it is all, science is also nowadays massively computer supported, so there is no barrier uh, to introduce uh, computer techniques uh, within science. Uh, it also faces some problem of its own. Um, problem with uh, credibility, and uh, you may have heard about reproducibility crisis, and also information overflow, like uh, um, people cannot read everything which is published at the moment, and uh, you may miss things, and it may be a problem. And actually, especially the last problem is a problem where computers are typic typically good at, okay? So it would be nice to uh, be able to help. And last but not least, a lot of has been done already on e-science and even semantic e-science. There was a very interesting tutorial on that uh, on Sunday. Um, so this is uh, talking about good ideas. I don't know, but uh, something I was doing, and I, it was published in 95. And the idea was that scientists would express formally their knowledge, the, the, the topic they were working on and the theory they had about it, and uh, they will be able to um, submit it to um, cons what I used to call consensual knowledge bases, okay? And then in this consensual knowledge basis, you can take advantage of the fact that it is explicit and that it is formalized to tell, oh, but this is contradictory, which was what is there, or it is redundant, or you should formulate this better in order to fit into the, the actual landscape. And so it was uh, the goal of the... Of the researcher to um, submit knowledge that would be accepted, and it was uh, based on a peer review uh, protocol. Okay, but this did not took off, okay? We don't do that at the moment, but maybe someday we will do that, or some other will do that. Uh, so, as I said, we can do semantic e-science nowadays, so I will try to give a, a small example of that. Um, so usually people start with, there are people doing research and they write papers, papers cite papers, papers may be able to describe experiments, uh, experiments may be an alteration of another existing experiment, and the goal of this experiment is to test an hypothesis, both the experiment, well the hypothesis will be about some objects, and um, uh, the experiment will manipulate this object. It may also use uh, software and hardware, and finally, it will produce data. Uh, this data will support some results, and you can also use statistical tests in order to qualify the confidence or the significance of the result that you have uh, obtained, okay? So this is basically the representation of an experiment in a paper. This is a bit more complex than that, but I won't uh, uh, elaborate on this. So the point is that we already have a lot of uh, ontologies which allows to do that, okay? So all the technology that we have is able to do that, and we have examples of projects which are about this, uh, this kind of things. And when you are in this state, um, you can start to ex take advantage of this knowledge. For example, is there a paper that contradicts what I'm writing in my paper? Uh, this hypothesis that I'm making, does it subsume or is it subsumed by another hypothesis that has been published? Does my experiment is prone to refute my hypothesis or not, okay? That uh, is uh, very important because otherwise the experiment is not useful at all. Does the result support or uh, uh, contradict uh, the hypothesis or does the test apply to the result? All these red uh, arrows are application that actually requires knowledge to be uh, implemented. And they would be very useful for scientists. Actually, for me as a scientist, they would be very useful for me. Um, there is some uh, important points. They could be used at design time or post hoc. So what I describe is an experiment described in a paper, but it's not very good to, to, to think about that because once you have described the experiment in a paper, it has been carried out, etc., and uh, you'd better know before 
if it's refute or not, uh, it's prone to refute or not the hypothesis. Okay? So it's interesting to have this at, at the design time. It helps you to design your experiments. Uh, it may be used to uh, probe experiment pre-registration. So experiment pre-registration is something that uh, as some people try to promote at the moment. This is, in my opinion, a very good idea, uh, but it may not take off because there is a lot of people that don't agree with that. What is the idea is that when you plan to test something in an hypothesis, instead of doing all the work and submitting a paper at a, at a journal, you will first submit the design of your experiment with the hypothesis and what you're supposed to do. This has actually three benefits. The first one is that the reviewer can tell you earlier that they don't like your experiment on why. Okay? And the corollary of that is that if they like it, basically, when they have accepted the experiment, the paper is accepted. This has another corollary, which is uh, it goes against the bias that we only publish positive results. Actually, if the experiment is testing a relevant hypothesis and uh, the result is negative, it is worth publishing. Okay? But if you submit a very good uh, improvement of a system and a knowledge wrap to ISWC and you show by experiment that it doesn't work very well, your paper will be rejected, I can tell you. Okay? So maybe this could be implemented as well in this community. But it's better with journal than conferences. Um, and there is a last point with uh, experiment pre-registration. That I don't remember. I will, may come back on this later, but that's okay. Uh, but this is really a very, very nice uh, idea. Um, and moreover, what I presented only applies proven technology. We, we don't really need a um, uh, paradigm change or whatever in order to be able to implement that. Okay, so as I mentioned, some people are doing this, and it may be applied to other fields. I mentioned that so people in mathematics are using more and more term provers, for instance, um, and they could use it a bit more widely. Uh, but you can also think about observational uh, sciences, which are a bit different than the kind of experiment that I presented here. And of course, this is data also. Huh? The, 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 the description itself is data. So it could be used through uh, machine learning, huh? which could help you to uh, clean up your uh, information or uh, mining some interesting fact from the basis of uh, experiment that has been published. Okay, and so I think for this kind of idea, the really uh, important thing is incentive. Okay, this is the obstacle for this to take off. If people uh, do not feel insensitized to, to do it, uh, they won't do it. And I can tell you, for example, for my work, I really would love to have all the tools for, for, uh, for doing it because it provides me safeness okay, in what I publish. Okay? I have more, uh, more um, uh, uh, I'm able to, 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 to have more uh, insurance on the result that I get if I can uh, test it more formally. Okay, so the last uh, issue is uh, back to evolution. Um, so the idea is that, yeah, knowledge has to evolve. Uh, it uh, doesn't stay, it, it, it has to change. Um, I talked about scientific knowledge, but all knowledge is not scientific knowledge, and it doesn't evolve in the same way, okay? We've got methodologies which have been elaborated for a certain level of safety, but we are actually using knowledge even where, if we are not sure of it, okay? And uh, it has to be evolved uh, while it is being used. Okay, so one of the principles that you can take advantage of to consider this problem is cultural evolution. Uh, cultural evolution stems from anthropology. It is basically natural evolution applied to culture. And culture, so people don't talk about culture generally in this domain. They focus on some particular aspects, like both designs, language, social structure, and they looked at how it evolved uh, under, under, uh, under history. Uh, and this has also been applied to science. It's called uh, uh, evolutionary epistemology. Uh, so there is a quote that I uh, like very much. 
uh, from this recent book is a cultural uh, the fast lane of cultural evolution bypassing the traffic jam of genetic evolution because uh, the point of a number of people is that actually genetic evolution takes quite a lot of time, okay? Not to have a, necessarily a mutation, but for it to spread. Uh, cultural evolution, because it spread more freely, like when talking in, conference, in conferences, then it allows to evolve knowledge far more quickly than genes evolve. Uh, so natural evolution can be seen as a, an abstract control mechanism based on three principles, variation, selection, transmission. And this has been implemented in computer already. So you have heard and uh, or knows very well uh, genetic or evolutionary programming or algorithm. Uh, but there is also experimental cultural evolution that has been uh, developed by some authors. Um, and so basically, the idea of experimental cultural evolution is that you've got population of agents bearing knowledge. Okay, so when you apply this to knowledge, this is their culture. And they are using their knowledge to interact with each other. Okay, this tells them how to interact, why, what answer they will give to, to others. And at uh, the issue of each interaction, uh, they will adapt their knowledge. So this is basically, you've got agents like that. They have knowledge which is actually the cause of their behavior. They have the pressure of the environment and the other agent through their behavior. And given the result of the interaction, then they will adapt their knowledge. And you run an experiment with a bunch of agents like that, and you can uh, observe how they are, depending on the kind of adaptation that they do, the kind of protocol that you're using, uh, the result that you have. So it has been used for abstract culture by Axelrod, uh, natural language evolution by Luke Stills, which did a lot of uh, work on that topic, and in this community by a number of other people uh, to uh, provide uh, ontology alignment evolution. Uh, but you can think about it uh, more widely, okay? Now imagine that you have a search engine which is enhanced by, let's say, by knowledge, okay? Like the one I presented before. And uh, since uh, this search engine is using knowledge for answering this question, and that it receives feedback the usual way, it is able to know, for example, if the answer that it gave is accurate or not. Okay? So it could use also adaptation operator in order to adapt the knowledge that he has used in order to be more accurate the next time. Okay? And you can imagine this to be applied to a meta search engine or a community of a search engine which interact with each other. Okay, so it is not just an agent in the lab, but this is a kind of, uh, of uh, application that would allow evolve knowledge. So what has to be done to do that? Very two important things. Um, the first one is understanding the general principle of knowledge evolution, because we're, we are not able to tell at the moment. And the second one is its articulation of this with the semantic web in general. Uh, on the first aspect, this can be inve investigated theoretically by um, uh, defining uh, formally uh, what is happening and finding the properties of the uh, mechanisms. Or you can test this mechanism experimentally, which is mostly be done at the moment. It can also be uh, done in relation with uh, social science and the humanities in order to have a, an idea of how it works for us. Um, for the articulation with the semantic web, you really need the mechanisms in order to implement the adaptation of knowledge. You really need the read white web because if you want to share knowledge, you will, should be able to publish it. And you also need non-breaking operability, interoperability. Okay, so we've got the 404 error message, which is very well known. And uh, when a user receives a 404 page, this is not the end of the world. Okay, maybe it will fix his uh, URI. Maybe it will look to another site in order to have the answer to his question. Um, so it should not be the end of the world when uh, some knowledge expressed is inconsistent. Okay, we will, should uh, have something to cope with that. So it's time for me to conclude. Uh, where are we? So if you remember the diagram I showed before, basically the semantic web is still a baby, okay? It's still using a lot too much data and not enough knowledge. That's basically the point. Um, 
And the semantic web is maybe used to uh, fill silos to the benefit of some commercial interest that learn knowledge but don't make it evolve, don't make it public, etc. And it can be used to help contribute to the knowledge of the humanity. Both may be pursued. There is no problem with that. But uh, maybe it could be interesting to be sure that um, following the first thread uh, does not uh, uh, um, uh, prevent following the second one. Okay, that would be uh, my message. And on the positive side, um, remember, uh, be optimistic. A good idea remains a good idea, and if you persevere, maybe you will see it happen. Okay. Uh, so, for finishing, what I ex some of what I expressed here and uh, in a different way uh, is in a paper um, which is to be published in the January issue of the Semantic Web Journal. Thank you very much. So I don't know if the, the goal is to take questions or, uh, uh, or to do them during the panel. Yeah, indeed, this is for you. So thank you for thank your you very much. wonderful talk. And then we are trying something slightly different. So instead of, let's say, having a question answering session for Jerome, we move directly to the panel. The title of the panel is How Much Semantic Goes a Long Way. And I invite all the panelists to basically come here on stage. And therefore, you can ask questions to Jerome, but the questions will also be kind of, will involve all the panelists and all the panelists. So we are kind of mixing between the two. So come over here. I have one. There is another Yeah, we'll pass it around. Or yeah, we can pass we it can around. Pass also yeah, this yeah. One around. That's better. That's the one? Yeah. Yeah. yeah just one. Uh, you, can, you can open to the audience now if you want. Feel free. Will? Yes, now it will. So while we set up the details of the panels, uh, you can think of your questions, and then we will open the time for asking questions. So, okay, so I can come already there. Yes, I have a question to uh, Jerome. Uh, thank you for your inspiring talk. And uh, I would like to, I, can, we, can we bring the slide number 15 from, from the previous presentation <laughs> or not? Slide, so it is impossible. Okay, uh, you told <clears throat> about uh, the, the way how we transfer knowledge. And uh, I would disagree with that slide. Uh, for instance, I would argue that animals and insects, uh, they oh, use... Uh, I have a lot of difficulty understanding you, so really... It, it's not so loud, right? Uh, I would disagree with uh, you, one of your, of your slides. Uh, for instance, uh, animals and the insects, they use different kind of language. Uh, so these motions or light signals or order, these are languages. Uh, and what we are doing here at this conference, we use textual languages. RDF, URI, URIs, uh, literals, all are textual languages. But you know, when Russian writer uh, Vladimir Dahl, 
he created uh, the dictionary of Russian language, and he could not manage to express all, co all concepts using just textual language. So he wrote, uh, he drew some images instead. And uh, maybe our textual te <clears throat> technology is too narrow, and we have to look at other medium, for instance, quantum computers or some other kind of knowledge representation, where we have to think about other uh, ways of publishing knowledge. Because, for instance, you cannot uh, copy a quantum bit. Yes. So what do we think about other medium, not just textual languages, but other kinds? Uh, thank you. Oh, it's open. OK. Um, uh, it's a very wide question. I mean, I was not advocating that we have uh, everything which is necessary and we will solve uh, all the problems that I mentioned uh, with this, actually. Um, uh, I, I just mentioned that there are things that we can tr start to do already now, and this was particularly where, what I mentioned uh, about e-sciences, okay? And uh, I uh, mentioned some other thing which may require uh, eventually may various different technologies uh, which remains to be invented. But for them to be invented, you really need to start somewhere. Okay, and that's really the point. I, especially in the, the, the last part of the talk, we are working on that. Uh, but uh, this is not the end, this is only the beginning. And if you want to start and to go ahead with that, you really have to abstract your problem and solve a uh, specific problem first. I'm sorry, I don't have a holistic approach to all, everything. So two further quick questions before we then move to the panel. Yeah. Thank you, Jerome. Um, I, when we discussed the other day you, uh, the whole issue of what you were discussing, the definition of knowledge, and thank you for giving your definition of knowledge. Now, you were using the whole time this term of a good idea. And there is uh, an author, uh, Jim Collins, who says, good is the enemy of great. And this is a well-known kind of phrase in, in management and in businesses. So what is a good idea, and what is a great idea, and what's the difference relationship? How do you get from good to great? Yeah, <laughs> I have one hour, and you give, give him the copy. This um... So, I'm a European, I'm not a native English speaker, okay? So, I won't make a difference really between this. I would have used the, the word great in order to, uh, I don't know, to emphasize, to give some uh, more marketing color of the expression, okay? <laughs> so, this is why I prefer use good ideas. I mean, it's more natural to me. Uh, okay, so... <laughs> So, uh, okay. so, first of all, thanks. Uh, as a young researcher, uh, what, this was one of the most inspiring uh, keynote I ever uh, had the pleased to, pleasure to watch. So, thanks. And um, I, a lot of ideas come to my mind when I uh, was hearing your words. Uh, specifically, I was thinking that uh, the scientific community actually started in the past, tried in the past to, st to study these things. Uh, it comes to my mind, the, Thomas Kuhn, the structure of scientific revolutions. And um, in this book, he tries to understand how knowledge progresses, how scientific knowledge progresses. So my question is, perhaps what is lacking is uh, the, cult the, sh the culture of science uh, in, in, the, uh, in uh, our community or in other communities. Like, young researchers do not have the study of uh, philosophy of science, these kind of topics, that will help, in your opinion, are these things that we should pursue it to uh, kickstart, let's say, our careers and uh, have uh, more impact in, uh, in the direction you are suggesting? Okay, so I will finish my talk. Um, yeah, actually, I said some, some things which are really paradoxical in this talk, okay? I told on one side, I said, um, do not uh, uh, worry to reinvent the wheel, okay? 
And on the other side, I said, um, anyway, we are always reinventing the wheel, which is basically true. Um, and, but at some point, it will catch up, and, and, uh, uh, and this, will be, uh, this will be OK. Um, so of course, you need to, the, the expression not reinventing the wheel, I mean, it's something with, which means you should know the story and not redoing exactly. You should understand why it did not work the first time. That would be very useful. Um, so uh, it is not a, a call for people. And, and, on, and on the other side, uh, my goal is to have knowledge which evolve. And I, 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 I ask people to publish knowledge so that the other can build on top of it. And so uh, this is uh, totally uh, opposite to say, oh, you can re you're free to reinvent the wheel. OK. Um, so with respect to your question, um, which was the, the, the progress uh, of, uh, so then, so there, there is a discussion to how science progress, and yeah, science uh, specifically. Um, Thomas Kuhn used the term revolution not in the way that I mentioned it here, okay, that it was uh, something that's changed actually. And um, uh, so just for, because people say, yeah, Thomas Kuhn says that you ch should change paradigm. That's actually not what he said. He spent all his thesis uh, to study how scientific revolution occurs. And the main finding is that it only occurs if you know very well the current standard theory. Because then, when you ch got to change the paradigm, you should show how it is better than the others. That's really the, uh, one of the important uh, things about that. And this also advocates for uh, not forgetting the past and being aware of it, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't know. That's just an element. Okay. Actually, you keep that. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move into a panel. Jerome will be one of our panelists. So it's sort of like a television spin-off where the main character just becomes one of the cast and then other people get to play. Uh, we're missing a panelist, so we will begin with the three of us and hope she shows up. And if not, we will do what we need to do. But uh, <clears throat> we look forward to having many of you participating. So we designed this in a way to move through quickly to where we can get to hearing from the audience and interacting, and including you all interacting with each other. Uh, I'm starting with this slide for, for two reasons. One is because Fabian was way too modest to mention yesterday that he has now joined Dean and I as a third author on the new edition of the Semantic Web for the Working Ontologist, and we wanted to welcome him in a sort of larger forum. <laughs> but uh, the real reason is because while we were working on the new book, this question came up, right? In the, in the first edition, uh, Dean and I really started very much from a sort of uh, start with the least expressive uh, kind of work and work our way up. The second edition, <clears throat> we had a little bit more using sparkling things. And so as we went into the third edition, the question of sort of how do we address the issue of what the role of semantics or knowledge, et cetera, is? So, so um, you know, obviously the title is a play off of uh, something that I said a long time ago. This is the T-shirt of my um, this T-shirt of my research group from. Uh, this was actually a T-shirt in 1998. It said, "A little semantics goes a long way." Uh, that became the slogan for the DARPA agent markup language, DAML project. DAML ended up joining oil, oil, uh, a, a European project called OIL. DAML plus OIL came together, went into a standardization process that ended up producing something called OWL, which some of you have heard about. Uh, meanwhile, there was also spinoffs to Sparkle, to a new generation of RDF, et cetera. So, there were, so the linked data world was very little semantics. The Ontology world started somewhere in the middle and then kind of grew out. Now it's 20 years later, and the question sort of becomes how much semantics goes how far. So that's sort of what we were discussing, and we thought that would make a really nice panel topic. So that today's panel is sort of a little bit about just rethinking some of the ideas of what is expressivity, what is semantics, what do we need to be sharing 
and things like that. These are the four participants, of whom three are here. So Valentina, Jerome, and I will do what we can. I'm supposed to be the moderator and not talk much, but maybe since we have a missing panelist, I'll feel free to occasionally weigh in. So with that, without, with that, what we thought would be a way to do this today, rather than having people get up and do prepared slides and things like that, especially as Jerome just got a chance to do that at length, I'm going to start by asking the panelists each a specific question, um, <clears throat> and then we'll sort of, I have a general question for the panel, which I then will also throw out as a general question to the whole audience and or take your questions. And there will be somebody with the microphone wandering around. So um, I, I may as well start with you, Valentina. <laughs> I was going to start with Annika, but she's not here. Um, <clears throat> So one of the criticisms that I know we've discussed that people have posed about the semantic web is that it, um, and this goes all the way back to the very early days, people claiming that it wouldn't work unless we could reach some form of uh, very strong ontological consensus, right? We all had to sort of agree on the ontologies. Um, and, you know, obviously that's difficult to attain. So the question is, you know, sort of, is this broad scope ontological agreement a myth or a must or something in between? Thank you. Um, actually, I think this argument has been overhyped by critics of the Semantic Club. And the last 20 years have demonstrated, have demonstrated that actually the Semantic Web can cope, is resilient to having different ontologies on the same domain and people choose the one they want. But likewise, in certain domains and in certain applications, there are some ontologies that emerge, evolve in a way seamless through some sort of cultural evolution, I would say, as um, uh, the ontology of choice as the one that is used as an interlingua and then the other ones are mapped. So I don't think, actually, we should push towards a centralized or a forced broad agreement because that is infeasible. At the end of the day, as humans, we are used to interact and communicating despite ontological mismatches, despite calling things different in different ways, and despite thinking of a certain entity, a certain thing, in a different way. I mean, we have different prototypes for the same concept, in a way. So broad ontological agreement is not necessary. However, one thing that the semantic web has somewhat forgotten, I would say, in the past 20 years, it's its nature as the knowledge for the agents, these things that are capable of distributed, um, that, that are distributed, that are capable of decision making, that should take this distributed knowledge and utilize it to perform some task. And so um, this has kind of re-emerged re recently because Fabian has been pushing the notion of uh, hypermedia agents where basically the agents interact between themselves but also with humans and so they do need some form of agreement but I would argue that the agreement is not necessarily enforced. It's agreement that emerges through the interactions. It's only transient because it's based on and scoped by the specific transaction and then they evolve their knowledge through transactions and something that we were discussing yesterday. So, yes, it's, it's a bit of a myth and it's a bit of a, an unfair criticism, I would say. No, I'm going to ask Trump a different uh, question. Different. <laughs> so, Trump, here's your starting question and people will see there's a method to my madness. It would have been better if I had the third question, but I'll do that. Um, so you actually used e-science as one of your examples. And e-science is a great example of where there's been some of this tension. So for example, arguably, you know, the most effective ontology in bio was the gene ontology, which had essentially two relations, card, uh, part halls and uh, class, subclass. So in fact, we still can't do it now because we won't agree on part all. That's another issue. Um, but so it was fairly low expressivity versus, uh, you know, if you go to the OWL2 spec, you'll see that many of the most complex um, additions from the first OWL were thing, like, things like qualified cardinality restrictions and things like that used examples from science. Um, so sort of that whole community has had tremendous arguments about expressivity as well as about, you know, sort of the more philosophical aspect of 
things. But but on the sort of expressivity, quality side, where do you come down and where do you see that playing out? Um, so I, I, I don't have a, a strong uh, position on that. You think it's better? Okay. No, I'm just going to... Um, no, what you should realize is the, the acoustic is very difficult for us. Uh, when you ask questions, try to be clear because we have a lot of trouble understanding what is, goes through the mic. Um, so the, 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 if people are fine with low expressivity ontology, they should use it, okay? Uh, however, scientists, if they've got to express the statement that they prove, usually uh, in their papers, then it's slightly higher expressivity uh, in principle. And so um, I'm fine that, for example, the ontology of some genes and some protein are using maybe not a small number of properties, but uh, a low expressivity language. But uh, the statement about them may be uh, slightly more expressive. So I can give an example, which is we are doing experiment where we are testing a hypothesis. And uh, the, the point for me was, uh, um, uh, is it possible to uh, express formally? And actually, it is met. It is not all. Uh, how we test the hypothesis? Okay, we say this is faster than this. Okay, what does it mean for this observed variable to be with respect to this other, etc.? And this is people that people don't do. Okay, if you do, if you look at experimental science paper, they actually could write this, and they don't write this. And so I tried to do it with one of my students, and she actually managed to do it uh, relatively naturally. But the real interesting point is that now, if you have got the instrumentation beside this, then you can test that automatically that the hypothesis is uh, supported by the result or it's not supported by the result. You could apply the statistical test, which usually is expressed mathematically, um, but you could also check that you are using the right statistical test, which is already kind of a problem in uh, various uh, areas of, of science. And uh, so I think the, the, the point is that as soon as people realize that on one side, um, this is useful to do that because it provides them more safety on the result that they publish. And on the other side, we have done our job and they've got the right tools for doing with this. Okay, I think this, the condition would be ready for this kind of application to take off. And so we should make this happen. So I'm going to... Um I'm still in charge for a minute more, and then we'll... What, we're going to do a little bit more, and then I'll throw it open. Um, <clears throat> so I want to ask the panelists to sort of look at the cross product, as it were, of some of these uh, kind of questions, and then sort of throw that out to the audience as a starting place in the discussion. So <clears throat> one of the things we've all been revisiting many, many times in this semantic web work has been exactly this issue of consensus, uh, you know, agreement versus um, separate silos versus linking silos. So, you know, you can find almost anywhere in that space of we must all agree to nobody has to agree on anything. Uh, you know, an argument in a paper that's appeared in this conference in the past 19 years. Uh, so part one is sort of achieving consensus. Part two is one of the ways that that's been gotten around in many of the systems is by kind of reducing that to interoperability and therefore using fairly low expressivity, right? So in other words, the, the knowledge that's transmitted or the, you know, to use the terms you were doing, the cultural knowledge would be at a fairly low and easy to express level. So I guess I'm gonna start asking, by asking the two of you kind of where you see that trade-off, is that a real thing? Is that something we as a community should be, you know, how should we be thinking about that? And then I'm basically gonna throw that Start by throwing that same question out to the audience, so you can all think about it. So, how do I see that? Is that uh, first? First, there are obstacles. Oh, sorry. Uh, first, there are obstacles. If we are using um, technologies, languages that are perceived by uh, the people who, are, who have to use it as too complex, then they won't use it. Okay, and so that's, that is uh, already a problem, okay? And so this may be the reason why they reduce expressivity. 
But if they reduce expressivity in the hope to find a wider consensus, this will not work. This will end up in some debate like, if you are not with me, you are against me, and things like that. Um, so uh, actually, maybe the way to achieve consensus is uh, to have a more expressive language, which allows you to express nuance and uh, to uh, uh, be able to isolate in which uh, statement you agree and in which other statement you eventually don't agree, and you may end up agreeing uh, in the end. Um, but so there is a tension between uh, is is this wishable and is this uh, actually doable easily so that people can adopt this kind of uh, language. Thank you. Um, there's also the issue that often the agreement has been established in a bilateral way and that makes it a little bit easier and but lends itself to have lower expressivity kind of terminology. Whereas if we started moving towards the kind of thing that Jerome is talking about, and I'm afraid, you know, in, in a way, uh, Jerome and myself kind of preach to the same choir, and we find ourselves in agreement, so you don't get much divergence uh, of uh, opinions. But if you start looking at that, maybe we should also consider some more complex ways of reaching this agreement. I mean, I'm thinking about the field of argumentation, and whilst I'm not you know, necessarily in saying that we should embed argumentation in all of our applications, some form of um, interaction that lends itself to a form of persuasion, negotiating knowledge, you know, negotiating what is pertinent to a certain problem and how we represent this being pertinent, so the complexity of the problem of reaching the agreement and reaching the agreement towards a certain goal. Um, really needs something that is a little bit more expressive of what we have now. So, um, I know there was a... You guys hold on to this, I got my own. <laughs> yeah, so, the, the question has actually something to do with this conflict between uh, reaching consensus or agreement and expressivity. So, the Semantic Web has had an evolving relationship with statistical learning in the context of this of this problem. And so my, my, my question to the panel is, how do you see the um, relationship, specifically with uh, deep learning and, and neural networks in general, in, in the context of this relationship? So in this meeting, we've seen examples where the deep learning was creating additional input, a prior, if you want. And in other cases, also hypotheses about neural networks assigning properties to semantic representations that would then propagate in the representation. So I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts on this evolving relationship. Okay. So, um, actually, going back to Jerome's talk and inventing the wheel, um, there was a lot of hypes, um, hype um, um, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, about machine learning, in particular um, sub-symbolic machine learning. Then we went on to symbolic machine learning, and that was quite predominant, and that, that went down. I think at some point, the machine learning community will realize that they need knowledge. They need knowledge that is expressive, that is sufficiently expressive to provide the background and the constraints to their methods. So there will be some form of feedback relationship between our field and the machine learning field, whether then it will move into the neurosymbolic learning that we're seeing now or will take another form that I can't predict. No. Do you want? You don't have to, we don't have to all answer everything, and I want to answer that question, but I'm the moderator, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Avi. Actually, let's do this. Since not everybody knows everybody else, to say the least, uh, when you start your question, please introduce yourself first. Hi, so my name is Avi Bernstein. Um, I actually want to answer your uh, question, Jim, with uh, something from Jerome's slides. Uh, Jerome mentions that it's important to get the incentives right, and some of you know I've been a strong advocate of that. Um, I think the problem you're raising is not a question of more or less expressivity. It's a problem of are the incentives right for people to actually put in the expressivity or not, because if the incentives are right, this is what we see in the gene field, they may put in more expressivity and in all other fields it's not. And one of the main problems is that it's not click, like, buy, uh, to again refer to the talk, because 
the great thing that the semantic, in, that's happening in the semantic web is the machines strip away the ads, right? So how are we going to incentivize people to put in that stuff, I think is a huge question that we should turn to. And once they have the incentives, they will use all the bells and whistles that we can offer them. So maybe it's time for us to leave the comfort zone of expressivity in these things and think about incentives. So, so I mean, let me throw the question, a question back to you, and then I'll to Benno, because uh, Jerome mentioned uh, a quote by an article you and Natasha and some other bozo wrote that uh, talked about a, uh, a circle of, of, you know, a, a, a um, <clears throat> what, what was the word? Uh, not the, I can't believe I'm blanking on it. A virtuous, virtuous circle, virtuous circle, uh, and sort of said the incentives, though, from business were against that. Now my question to you is, having just said, again, that, you know, we see that incentives, how would you argue Jerome's argument that, that said, and Jerome, you should be preparing because I'm going to throw that back to you to say, okay, so then why in the knowledge space, the belief space, the cultural space, will it be any different? So I think what Jerome points out very, very acutely, it's not me, very acutely, is that there, there is a you know, tragedy of the commons, and I'm sorry to use, start using economic speak here. There is a tragedy of the commons effect in sharing knowledge, right? So for those of you who don't know what the tragedy of the commons is, it's the idea that uh, you know, if I contribute to the common, everybody profits from it, then other people don't have an incentive because you just wait for another stupid person to contribute to the common, and I mean stupid in quotes here. Uh, and uh, it's kind of in, you know, kind of supports antisocial behavior, and so everybody goes to the least, namely they only put as much in the common as they can profit from it. And I think the issue that you point out correctly, Jerome, is there is a tragedy of the commons problem here. Companies or individuals if you take them as the homo economicus, will only contribute as much as they can profit from it, and everything else they'll keep to themselves because they'll see it as a competitive advantage. Um, again, it gets back to incentives. I think the semantic web and all of this knowledge sharing works great as long as it's subsidized, and unless we come up with economic models for sharing, and that is our job, or our job talking to our neighborhood economists to come up with these issues, unless we come up with these issues, we will not have the virtuous cycle work, uh, you know, as an engine of knowledge sharing. Yes, if I can uh, understand, uh, no, answer this. I actually I agree with what you you've said. Um, yeah, I, I was not actually objecting to com the behavior of company. Uh, this is the normal behavior in the, in, in the state where we are. Also, these companies are usually very um, imaginative in um, creating new business models, so you, you, you can always find out that they will do something uh, very interesting. What I was objecting to is that this was the end of the semantic web, the end of the, you know, the, the, the topmost point of the semantic web, and it will not be. I, I, I was just saying, oh, there are other passes that may be uh, considered. Um, with respect to the, um, what did you say, the incentive, yeah? Uh, the incentive for sharing knowledge, actually this incentive has existed all over our worlds. Well, not necessarily, because, for example, the military are in all time also I've tried to keep secret some of the knowledge that they've discovered and so this time the, this uh, did sharing did not happen uh, but on the other uh, on the other side uh, I mean the knowledge of the humanity progress actually voluntary or involuntarily because not always the case uh, on a sharing basis and sharing is important it has to be done okay and okay we can some of these companies are clever enough to, to share some of their knowledge, so that's not too bad. But, but basically, I agree with you. So I'm going to uh, um. channel a well-known colleague of mine who um, <clears throat> invented this thing that had very few incentives for people to share knowledge and ended up with lots and lots of people putting stuff out there. It was, we, we call it the World Wide Web. Um, and if you talk to Tim Berners-Lee, right, one of the things he feels is that 
much of the incentive originally was that people wanted to share knowledge. That once it became economic incentives that uh, drive that, that drives towards much larger companies, that drives to the ownership that you're now seeing by uh, entities like Facebook or large search companies or things like that. So, so in a sense, uh, his argument is for re-decentralization, for a new making it easier to share knowledge for those people who want to do it for free and do it in a way that's commensurate. And, you know, if you look at book publishing, right, there's publishing to make money and there's publishing to share your ideas, if you look at many other things. So, so I think his argument was a lot of what motivated people originally was commonality, finding other people, uh, communicating with people who might agree with you even though you disagreed with the consensus of the world. I have an example of that I've used occasionally. Uh, in his new work in Solid, that's some of what's uh, being explored too, is how to bring some of that back. Uh, change, again, he's also looking at economic incentives because you do have these large things. But, you know, the argument was the incentive to share should be that it's easy to do and people like doing it, and therefore disincentivizing that sharing, which is what <clears throat> Again, I'm putting words in his mouth, but this is more or less what he said at his ASAM talk, might be what's causing a lot of our problems with getting this data shared. I'll just throw that reflection out there on his behalf. I don't know who has um, it there. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to comment about the Please issue introduce around... Yourself. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Please okay. introduce yourself. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Dougal Watt from Meaningful Technology. Um, we were talking about expressivity before, and um, I don't think the issue is that OWL and RDFS per se aren't expressive enough. It's much more from a business community perspective and business technologist perspective that some of the things are lacking in a semantic web context to be applied in a business context. And things around um, primarily things like transaction support in Sparkle, um, that's a big thing that really worries the hell out of the business community. Um, and so expressivity itself doesn't really impinge until you start integrating data and then, and then the knowledge graph world has actually impinged massively in the business community now and it's a golden opportunity for the semantic web community to start layering over the top expressivity because people, people start in property graphs typically in business and then they find that they run up against limits really, really quickly and their expressivity limits and they don't really know where to go next. But then as soon as they move into the semantic world, uh, the biggest question that rears its head is interoperability. And that's mostly about ontology matching, and the business community has no idea how to do it. There's really, um, you have to switch into the academic community to understand how to do alignment and matching. Um, and that, that is a big problem to the business community. So how I exchange my data with another company becomes very problematic. Wasn't well, really a question. <laughs> So um, <clears throat> let me see if I can sort of very simplify, oversimplify what you said. But you were sort of saying it's not really about level of expressivity. It's expressivity is are we expressing the right things for the needs of people's semantic use, at least in the business community. So yeah. that's essentially turning it into a question. Are we, you know, should we be looking in a different direction? Again, it's to the panel and to everyone. Yeah. So... We worked for years on this topic, ontology matching. And, um, well, so from, our, from my standpoint, actually, the goal of ontology matching was not that everybody used the same ontology. It was rather that people can, as uh, Valentina said, uh, cooperate with uh, different ontologies. But if you want to do this precisely, Actually, one of the points that I would argue is that the simpler the ontologies are, the most expressive the matching language should be. Uh, because then if you have nuance, you cannot take the, the nuance in the ontology because they don't exist. Uh, you have to express them in the matching. And this is something that is started nowadays. That uh, I was uh, recently in a PhD thesis exactly on expressive ontology matching, try to find... Uh, because then it's far more difficult to find correspondences uh, and to find the right statement to relate some uh, unexpressive uh, statement, uh, expression, yeah, classes or stuff like that. Um, no, actually, no, I totally agree with uh, Jerome. Uh, so the, the, the ontology matching workshop 
um, has done quite a lot to advance the understanding, but in reality, the matching methods that we have at the moment are very limited in what they can do. There's quite a lot of work that is going into complex matching, and if you go there, the level of expressivity uh, increases dramatically, and we get into problems that are more about actually discovering new knowledge. So, you know, do I have a concept in one ontology that corresponds to an expression in the other ontology, so can I reformulate things? Uh, but also, um, a good um, chunk of work is coming from the database community, and there was an invited talk uh, this year's ontology matching by Juan Sagredo, and he was actually pointing out the fact that if you have, you know, different schemas, and you're trying to understand, you know, what is the concept of an order, this could be expressed in many uh, different ways, and it does involve quite a lot of extra knowledge from a knowledge scientist, a knowledge engineer that knows exactly how these schemas are used within the business organization. So we do need to find ways to actually elicit this knowledge effectively from the business organization, because otherwise nothing that you know, can come out of the ontology alignment community will be absolutely effective. Yeah, typically a business would, would think about alignment from, I give you instance data, and then it you do something with it. If I, if I can... Okay. If I can come back on that, actually ontology matching is also seen as you take the two ontology and you do the matching, you've got an alignment and you can use it. And of course this is a very limited way of, uh, uh, of uh, behaving and um, you've got to start from somewhere. And so this is where we started. Actually, the, the, the idea of uh, agent cooperating in order to agree uh, may allow them to eventually do a better matching, but also allow them to alter their ontology so that they can better understand the other and better communicate. So I, I think this is in the line of your talk yesterday, that uh, things are not necessarily frozen, and uh, by the interaction you can improve on this. Uh, I'm Aldo Ganjemi. Um, just a quick, um, we are talking a lot about logical expressivity, but maybe what we forget sometimes, and regularly it is injected again at times, is that we need also cognitive expressivity. So people as a tons of ontologies in their mind and experts have it. Can't hear me? Yeah, we don't understand everything. I, okay, so I'll try. So one of the things is that you should know about these microphones is if you hold it straight in front of your mouth rather than down here, you get a much okay. better reception. If you'll notice. Is it better now? So hold it here. No, hold it right in front of your mouth. Like Low front. If, like you've ever seen, if you've ever seen Lady Gaga perform, it's like this. Right. Shouting. Uh, okay, you know, I was asking, uh, I was observing that we are talking a lot about logical expressivity and how much we should allow but when we say a little semantics, we should not only consider the logical expressivity, but also cognitive expressivity. So people have tons of ontologies in their mind, and Semantic Web has just scratched the surface of that, as also Jerome implicitly um, expressed in his talk. So we also need to, to kind of uh, uh, collect this, uh, express, uh, this, uh, this expressivity that stays in the, in the, the real human societies. Something has been done in uh, the community of uh, design patterns and knowledge patterns. For those that do not know about that, that is quite a story in the semantic web. I wanted to mention it. But uh, sometimes the, the, the degree at which you know, the, the granularity we want to have in terms of expressivity uh, should be considered with reference to the cognition we want to, to take into account. That's my provocation. Yes, we should, and uh, we know very well that there's a huge gap between uh, you know, the cognitive level and the, what is in the head of the experts, the business people, etc., and what we can express. The design patterns were a good way to bridge that gap, but I think we, we need a little bit more um, refined mechanisms. Also, there is another issue. Um, you know, the cognitive aspect is not necessarily 
shared because there is not a willingness to share. I mean, for people, we know that knowledge is power. You know, it gives you a competitive advantage in an organization. So again, where are the incentives for sharing knowledge that then has to be encoded in some form of a logical representation? Have we found these incentives? I'm not entirely sure. So, uh, so I think there was one on this side. Let me, let me make a, a strong plea that given the acoustics of this room, keep your questions short and, and specific, or, because otherwise most of the people in the room will have trouble hearing what you're actually saying. So try to focus on a few words. I, I don't know who has the microphone. Yeah. yeah. So can, can, can you hear me? This Pedro Zeckoli. Uh, so I really like Jerome's talk uh, where he sort of laid out this idea that you distill knowledge from observation and sort of data or information. And it seems to me in the semantic web we think that the distillation is to put it in some logical form. Uh, but you know, in that general scheme, if you look at the birth model, it's a distillation of knowledge that has a query interface in English where I can mask a word and it gives me an answer. Uh, so is that a second wheel uh, that will make the first wheel work much better? Um, yes, I, so I, I mentioned a bit that machine learning could be helpful and I, 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 I think it, it, it should play uh, a great role. Um, I think we, we also will see it evolve in the next year because at the moment uh, um, it requires a whole lot of data in order to do a relatively limited tasks and so it will have a, uh, we will have to be, we and the people working on, on this topic will have to be really clever to, to be able to address a variety of, uh, of tasks in this, uh, in this realm. But of course, yes, this, uh, uh, I talk about artificial intelligence. This is integral part of artificial intelligence. And, um, and when I, I, I'm talking about uh, adaptation, at the moment we are, trying to do simple things, so we have simple adaptation operators, but then it goes very quickly into reinforcement learning, but it can be also all other kind of learning that we are using for, uh, for learning knowledge, actually. Um, I don't know if this answered the question, because it's really terrible to, to, to we have a lot of difficulty understanding it, I, I, me in particular. Sort of, yeah. I mean, it, it's. I, I think uh, I view a bird model as a sort of box where you can ask questions in English about pretty much anything uh, and get probabilities of words that uh, are the answer. And so it's a very general purpose knowledge uh, that uh, you know covers any topic in, in uh, that we can talk about. And so it seems complementary to the specialized knowledge that we're putting in knowledge graphs or knowledge bases. Yeah, so I don't see it as a difference between uh, specialized uh, or, or general. Uh, so this is the kind of thing I wanted to show by saying that during all our life, we are still relying on the basic mechanisms of uh, acquiring knowledge. Um, and uh, indeed, in this sense, this is, uh, uh, this is very complementary. What I w wanted to defend is, and this is really the point of complementation, huh? uh, uh, what I really wanted to defend is that uh, uh, development of the humanity has gone through explicit knowledge, and it gives a very nice way to uh, propagate knowledge without relearning it. And um, it would be very, a pity that uh, we cannot uh, use computer to be able to take advantage of this. That was basically my point. And now, especially now that we see that computer are, are able to take advantage of the other part as well. 
And now the question of articulating this, I think it is on everyone's minds all over the world at the moment. Huh? Every uh, funding institution will be happy to fund you on good idea to merge symbolic and uh, neural knowledge. Over here, and again, let me remind people to please introduce yourself when you start the question. So, uh, my question is in the line of the question of the ontology of design patterns. You have a lot of research on the foundation of ontologies, and you have a, a representative, a common sense knowledge are represented in these ontologies, like Dolce and Sumo and so on. And this ontology seems to be too complicated to use in the semantic web community. I heard about many times in this uh, conference that uh, foundational ontologies are very hard to use. And I'd like to know your position about that, if it's uh, useful to use these ontologies, bring these ontologies to this community, because you have a lot of uh, 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 research on the foundational, on these applied ontologies, in, uh, for example, in another conference, and I would like to see your position about uh, uh, is it useful to use this kind of ontologies in order to share knowledge. One, anyone can answer any question, but two. Right, so if I understand your question correctly, I think it also depends what, for the kind, on the kind of understanding that you want to get. For some things, a simpler interschema is sufficient, and you, know, you don't need to get to the expressivity of Dolce. For other things, though, Something like Dolce or Sumo, it's absolutely essential. So I'm thinking, for instance, in chemistry or biology, etc. And they, uh, you know, if you if you look at those ontologies, they tend to use the BFO ontology as an upper level ontology, and that gives them the grounding on the common understanding of what things are. So um, I don't think you can look at that just. From a general perspective, you really need to look at the kind of use you're doing of them. So I was thinking that they could play their part, but they only could play their part if everybody agrees on them. And you put Aldo and Nicola Guarino in the same room and you start to see the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so the mic handlers are taking care of it. So there, then here, then there. Yeah, yeah, I know, and we're trying, but uh, <laughs> so are a lot of them. Thank you. Um, thanks for the panel, and uh, thanks to Do Watt for his question earlier about transaction. My name's Marcus Jowsey, and I work in industry um, with semantic technology. Hold, hold the mic to your mouth. <laughs> with, I work in industry with semantic technologies, and um, one of the things I note is getting semantics into a business, getting semantic technologies in there, is actually a, a um, cultural change that occurs within the business, but it's, it's driven by a, a strategic desire. And there's a bit of conflict there in that, um, in my experience, it's true that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And um, my question is, what is it about the academic directions at the moment that are addressing the cultural aspects of pushing um, uh, semantic technologies or enabling semantic technologies within business? And what is the message coming out from academia to help with that process? So uh, we invented te in semantic technologies. Does that count? Uh, <laughs> no, seriously. Seriously, I mean, again, I don't. I'm gonna. I'm gonna weigh in here because I've been making this statement for 20 years. I'm gonna probably. I hope I'm alive to be making it for 20 more. Uh, I don't think the job of academia is to help business figure that out. I think the job of business is to help business figure that out. I think the job of academia is to help develop new and exciting and important tools that the businesses can take advantage of. And I'll give you an example, right? Uh, this thing called the semantic web 
helped revitalize, renew, and change these things called knowledge graphs, which are now a major aspect of companies throughout the world. Right? How those knowledge graphs get used, how they get expanded, things like that, may come back into our communities to look at and explore and find new ways of doing. So it, it's definitely, I'm a firm believer in, in a handoff between academia and industry or joint work or whatever way you want to see it. But don't say, you guys aren't doing the right thing to change business because at least when you, when you put academics up as the people who are supposed to change business, we did. You wouldn't have Google if there hadn't been Kleinberg and those crews. You wouldn't have other, anyway, sorry. Uh, that's, that, that, that's the third panelist talking. <laughs> So, right back. <laughs> but that said, right, I think it's that discussion does need to happen. I think you're right. Culture change is hard. Bringing semantics in is hard. I think one of the things we see happening now is a lot of smaller companies that are trying to look at, okay, how do we take the semantic advantage of the big companies, take it into the infrastructures that already exist? So there are a couple companies I know of that are looking at you know, sort of how we take the ontology story and move it back down to the um, SQL world rather than trying to force the SQL people to learn how to do Sparkle, things like that. So, you know, again, there's a lot of different ways people are looking at these kind of problems. Okay, uh, Aiden Hogan. Um, so my question is, in 2006, I saw a panel that was similar. It was online, maybe on video lectures. I think Frank was there, Ian was there, and Peter was there, for example. And I had just gotten funding for my PhD, and I remember thinking, wow, what have I gotten myself into, right? So my question is, how has your opinion changed in the past 10, 15 years? I would ask each of the panelists, has your opinion changed on this question? How much semantics goes? How far? Okay. So the question is, over the past 15, 20 years, how, how has it changed? Do you want to do it first? You first, then you then. Um. It has changed to a point. I think I've become more convinced that actually, um, for certain things, having you know a very rich expressivity, it's more an endurance. And there are sometimes, especially I'm thinking of ontology alignment. There are some things for which um, a rough and ready alignment is good enough, and we should not forget about that. And we should not necessarily, I mean, I'm, I'm getting more and more convinced that there is a, not a one-size-fits-all in many kind of situations. So we should really, really try to understand and characterize the problems and try to understand what works best. Um, so I'm becoming skeptical of solutions that are sold as a generic solution. Uh, so how these things evolve with respect to these statements? Um, I think, uh, Jim won. Uh, this statement is now uh, quite well established. I mean, this is, at the beginning, it was really a statement that they wanted to push, uh, to try to convince people, no, you won't have to do very complex things. You, you know, we are able to do smart things with uh, a little semantic. That was, I think this was the idea at the moment of shoe. And then at the moment we developed, oh, it rather be, started to be some kind of uh, discussion topic a bit more at that point. Eh? It was more hidden, Someone, some people wanted more uh, expressiveness. I'm, I mean, I really feel like someone from AI, and uh, this is what we are about. Um, don't come from database where you will reduce expressiveness for having things working. And so we pushed a bit, and I think we were right, because actually the technology that we had on uh, even logical reasoners uh, 20 years ago has nothing, well, nothing to do, no, not nothing to do, but I made a lot of progress uh, with this respect. And um, there is a, has also been a lot of work on the trade-off, which was something very classical before, but then it went very practical. Okay, well, you have people who decide to do for this or this fragment of O2 uh, because they have a particular kind of application. Uh, so, Actually, the title of the panel is also uh, showing from my perspective is, okay, I think this is really nice, but when the paramount of the semantic web is schema.org, and I was not especially talking about 
necessarily the expressiveness, um, then we won't go farther than that, okay? You will, you will have your restaurant, uh, you will know if it's open or closed, and if it's closed, yeah, you will have to think yourself about another restaurant. And uh, um, so having more expressiveness to, to be able to, to deal with that will be really interesting. So I know that there are search companies which are able to, to do better than that. I mean, uh, with other means, but I think we could try to do better than that with uh, this kind of means that I try to advocate today as well. Well, I'm going to say, as my opinion hasn't changed, that a little semantic goes a long way. However, you look at my literature over the past 20 years, you'll see that I've changed my opinion about what is a little, what is semantics, and what do we mean by a long way. <laughs> but, um, you know, again, I think there's a lot of different space, and that's why I thought this panel would be an interesting idea, was precisely to, to look at over these many years and over the evaluate about that evolution of this field. We've seen a lot, of, a lot of change in different people's ways of thinking about these things. And it's nice, you know, I think it's a necessary thing for our community to be revisiting some of these things rather than forming into sort of subcamps that don't talk to each other. So I still happen to be a big fan of this conference. Somebody? Okay. Yes. Uh, Valentina Presutti. Um, so I want to, um, this is a comment and it's related to the ontology question, uh, but also to what you just said. So I think that um, um, uh, my point is that the, the question, uh, how much semantics, uh, sometimes is perceived wrongly, like if we have to choose whether to either only uh, define and develop very lightweight um, ontologies or to go for more, uh, for richer expressivity. So I think that uh, actually it depends and, uh, and I think there is also a lot of experience in practice where for certain tasks we don't need very much, you know, a lot of expressivity but in other cases we have, um, we have Dolce or other ontologies uh, that are reused because they are needed, as Valentina was saying. So what I want to say is that actually I think that the focus should be to make this kind, these different uh, types of um, ontologies to coexist for the same data, and there are many cases where this could be useful. For example, you can use the same data for tasks such as knowledge, such as science discovery, but then you may want to use the same data only for presenting uh, the information, uh, imagine touristic uh, places or discovering new things. So in those cases, in those different cases, the same data, you may need, you know, different um, expressivity and capability of reasoning. And they must, so the point is that they must coexist and they must be compatible. This is something I think we are a little bit overlooking uh, these days. So if you want to comment. Good point. If you have the microphone, you win, right? So if you have the <laughs> microphone, start talking while someone else gets the microphone. <laughs> First here, then there, and then Carol. I'm in Halle, Australian National University. I was actually waiting for you to answer the question, but um, I wanted to build upon what Avi said uh, earlier. When you have incentives, you have people sharing knowledge that we see with schema.org. Uh, when you don't, in don't have incentives, I think we need to work on the consensus mechanism. And uh, it used to be that we developed lots of ontologies and knowledge top down and not bottom up. And now we see Wikidata doing that bottom up, a big community uh, developing from a bottom-up the ontology and the data. And I think that's a very successful model, but I want to hear your opinion on a collaboratively built ontology, if this is what we need, and maybe Wikidata is this what will provide that. Uh, yes, but it is also because I, uh, why I made a difference between data and knowledge. Uh, with respect to schema.org, there is an incentive if you're a restaurant to put your opening hours there because you will show up in the answer of the search. This is really definitive, but you only provide data, okay? Um, you know, if uh, when you have a research, if you've got a nice search engine on, I don't know, um, protein protein inter interaction, okay? which is able to work because there are elaborate knowledge expressed about proteins, which also looks about, uh, a bit about data, but 
not anyway. Uh, if you start having this and you realize as a researcher that your paper will not be cited because you won't appear in this uh, database search, then you will have an incentive. But it's not um, only about the opening hours of a restaurant, but it's also about actually the central topic of the researcher. So I think there can be some kind of thing. Of course, it's a bit, uh, it looks like constraining, but I, actually it's not more constraining than uh, be obliged if you're a restaurant to have your opening hours in, uh, in, 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 in this, except that the guy from the restaurant does not see it because it just updates his uh, interface and it works. So I think there's one over there and then Carol and then I'm afraid we're going to have to cut it off. Then. Hi, uh, Melinda Hodkowitz from uh, University of Western Australia. So uh, in the new year, uh, early, in, early next year, ISO, International Standards Organization, and the IEC will publish 21838, which is a top ontology standard. It's a standard that defines what can be a top ontology, and that will be closely followed by part two, which is about BFO. In my view, the standardization really legitimizes top-level ontologies for business, for especially for the industrial and the engineering sectors who don't do anything without a standard. And I just wondered if the panel, um, anybody, first of all, anybody in the audience who might have been involved in the development of these standards from this community, and secondly, for the panel, what do you think the role of international standards in the development of the semantic web might be? So um, I think we missed the last three or four words of that. Ah. So you said... For so the panel, you asked us a specific question and then we couldn't make it out. Yeah, so <laughs> sorry. Again. So I, I guess I'm asking, um, what do you think the impact of an international standard for top-level ontologies and the legitimacy of BFO as the first one might be on the, on the semantic web community? But I, I think the, the impact of uh, standards is uh, only determined by uh, whether people use them or not. Okay, and um, the semantic web comes from uh, the community of the web and before the community of internet, whose goal was uh, rather to do uh, open standards um, on which people can build and uh, which were only standardized when uh, people were actually using them. And so this ensures some success and some avoiding uh, to do a lot of committee stuff that is not uh, happening. This is totally different from the ISO side. I mean, when we started the semantic web, there was an ISO standard, topic maps. Some of you uh, may have, uh, so even Juan did not uh, heard about topic maps. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is not us who decide if people use standard or not. Uh, and even we certainly designed some W3C standards which are not very much used uh, at the moment, um, but we try to do our best, I guess. That's Hi. Um, right. uh, okay. So uh, I wanted to make a plea about uh, humility. So uh, I work extensively in life sciences where we use a lot of ontologies. I so much want to answer that, but I'm the moderator. 
<laughs> no, no, no. Well, I, I think, you know, again, if you go back to the original messaging, it was all about interoperability, right? Uh, the, probably the most little-known paper of the ones that Tim and I have ever written was one on, you know, it was actually the first linked data paper. It was about 2002. was very much about, it, we included services as well as data. And it was all about, you know, you need these different techniques to work together, and the ontologies had been built in these boxes that had no links into them. You couldn't link in, you couldn't link out. You could only use it in the tools that were built for the ontologies. So really, one of the first motivations of this whole community was interoperability, both within the ontology world and between the ontology world, the data world, and the sort of more general web world. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes we need to bring it back. But I think that that's... Uh, you know, actually, that was going to be my closing section, so I'll turn this into my closing statement, and then I'll ask each of the other two to make a closing statement. But I, I think this is a key thing, and I think it's why this particular topic keeps coming up and remains important. Because, again, if we were just a community on formalizing particular kinds of knowledge, which some people have, you know, make their goal of this, that's a very different thing than if we're looking at how do we make data more shareable, which is what a different group is doing. When you bring in the neural nets, when you bring in all of these other things, part of the question is how do we make these all work together? How do we make the mobile app web work with the more traditional back-end web? Because the ontologies are going to be a very hard thing to live, as it were, on the mobile web without them living on the back-end and then be using motivating sharing, things like that, IoT world. So, so, you know, I want to throw out to everyone that an original aspect of that a little semantics goes a long way was it was meant to be the interoperability level. And that's still a very important issue to me and I hope to the community. And I'll stop there and uh, actually, Jerome, why don't you take the next? So your last 30-second statement. <laughs> Uh, my last uh, thirty second statement no i i I think also it 's a matter of perception i don 't think uh, we are we are a relatively diverse community and that 's really nice i mean this is not one uh, one kind of person so but then from other from another side, and people may see it as monolithic, as trying to emphasize on this particular topic, or you should use these tools or not, but you have heard about uh, uh, knowledge patterns and, and uh, totally different uh, things and ideas, which are also developed here. So this, may, this is a matter of perception, so it's also our responsibility, but I'm not very good at that, so I don't have a statement. I think I'll go back to my original point. I think we really need to work on uh, mechanisms for sharing that are more dynamic, that are maybe focused on fragments rather than sharing the whole ontology, where we might decide to lower the expressivity of the mappings because it makes it a little bit better. And I think as a community, we do have the uh, expertise and the power to make this happen. So I, I, in a way, I challenge the community to make it happen. <laughs> So I'm just going to finish by asking you to join me in thanking both the panelists and the audience members who participated. <laughs>